Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you from this book about Kenya. And it is Elephant Week on the channel. So Topo is going to give us some sounds to his amazing ASMR ears. Let me put them up here to the mic. Tonight we're going to read some soft-spoken facts about Kenya. This book is a little old, but from what I can tell, pretty much all the facts are still accurate. So let's dive right in and read a bit about Kenya. This is where Kenya is located in the world. How sweet. <laughs> let's see. From savannah to snow. Even if you have never been to Kenya, you probably know what it looks like. Kenya's savanna is familiar from hundreds of movies, TV programs, books, and commercials. It's a little dark. I'm not sure. Anyway. <laughs> there we go. That's a little better. It's easier to see. It is the landscape many people imagine when they think of Africa. But nothing will prepare you for the excitement of going out on safari. Everyone is on the alert, trying to be the first to spot a giraffe, a wildebeest, or a lion. Suddenly, that distant rock you are scanning through your binoculars flaps its ears, and you realize you're looking at your first elephant. Millions of people visit Kenya in the hope of experiencing that special thrill. Others come to relax on the soft white sands of Kenya's beaches and swim in the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. The Fertile Highlands Nearly all of southwestern Kenya is cool, wet highland. The days there are sunny and pleasant. The altitude makes the climate near perfect for growing crops or raising livestock. White clouds drift across the landscape creating a changing pattern of light and shadow. At night, the temperature falls sharply and herders cluster around log fires. Millions of years ago, volcanoes erupted in this region. The ash they scattered created a rich, fertile soil that is ideal for growing crops of all kinds, from coffee and flowers to vegetables. There are two rainy seasons known as the long rains from about March to May, and the short rains from about October to December. If the long rains fail to arrive, farmers and herders prepare for drought and anxiously watch the skies in the last months of the year. The Plains Dry, grassy plains with scattered hills cover much of central Kenya. In the southeast, the plains become the savannas so popular with tourists. To the north and northeast, the plains become drier and more desert-like. The rainy season gets shorter. Months go by with no rain. It finally falls hard and fast, filling up dry riverbeds and turning roads into raging creeks. Coastal lowlands. In the east, the savannas and plains merge with the coastal lowlands on the Indian Ocean. Well watered by rivers, streams, and the regular seasonal rains, the soil is fertile and good for crops. Beaches with white coral sand, shaded by palm and coconut trees, line the coast. Around river mouths, the tangled roots of mangrove trees hold the swampy land together, preventing it from washing into the sea. Coral reefs with their varied and colorful sea life attract snorkelers and divers. Contrasting Cities Nairobi, Kenya's bustling capital, is just under 6,000 feet above sea level. People who aren't used to being so high above sea level take a few days to get used to the thin air. Only five miles south of the city, lions roam in one of Kenya's many national parks. Nairobi is a modern city, but cities near the coast have existed for longer. Mombasa's maze of narrow streets is full of architecture that shows the long influence of the Arabs who began living there in the 700s. 
There you go. Everyone learns to move slowly in the steamy heat. Wealth of wildlife. What a beautiful picture. Look at all the animals and the rainbow. Gorgeous. For people who like wildlife, Kenya is one of the most exciting countries in the world. Nearly every species of large land mammal lives there. There are hunters like lions and cheetahs, and peaceful herbivores like elephants and giraffes. Hippos live near the creeks and water holes. In the trees are scores of monkeys. Hundreds of types of antelope graze the varied habitats. There are shy forest dwellers like the bongo, which is hard to spot, and other antelopes like wildebeests that cross the grasslands in huge herds. In the past, many Europeans and Americans went on hunting trips called safaris to shoot animals for sport. The Kenyans banned hunting in the 1970s. Today, millions of visitors still go on safari, but the only legal shooting is with a camera. Savannah Herds and Hunters The grasslands are a dangerous place. They have many hunters and few places to hide. The animals that live there have to be large and powerful, like elephants or rhinos. Or they need to be like zebras and antelopes, which are fast and have sharp senses that warn them of danger. Zebras, giraffes, and antelopes feed on the tough grasses and scattered trees of the savannas. The greenery springs up after seasonal rains, so the herds move across the plains to find food. In turn, they are shadowed by carnivores. Lions, cheetahs, African wild dogs, hyenas, and jackals. They're so cute, though. Because the savanna is so dangerous, the babies of many animals can stand up within minutes of being born. They are ready to flee from danger. A baby giraffe can run with its herd when it is only two or three days old. Its mother defends her calf from predators by swinging her head like a battering ram or kicking with her long legs. Most times she can fight off an attack, but even so, only about half of the baby giraffes will survive their first year. A lion cub, on the other hand, has few enemies. It does not need to grow up so quickly. It lives on milk from the females in its pride for about six months. While the adult slays in the shade, the cubs have play fights. Their games teach them the skills they need to begin hunting when they are four or five months old. Whatever the pride kills, the cubs are allowed to eat only when the adults have had enough. Life in the Highlands Kenya's highlands are home to many animals that live nowhere else. The patches of forest in the Taita Hills are home to three of Kenya's endangered birds, the Taita Apollis, Taita Thrush, and the Taita White Eye. In fact, nine of Kenya's endangered species are birds of the highland forests. The needs of wildlife and the needs of people have come into conflict in many of Kenya's forest areas. People have cut down trees for firewood or to clear land for farming. Animals that live in the forests find it hard to survive. The shy mountain bongo with its glossy, white, and chestnut-striped coat has almost vanished. In 2004, conservationists brought 18 bongos to Kenya from zoos in the United States. They planned to breed captive bongos and release them into the wild. So far, several calves have been born and three males are about to be released. Kakamega Forest in western Kenya is a patch of tropical rainforest. More kinds of plants and animals live in rainforests than in any other habitat. Kakamega is home to more than 300 species of birds, 350 species of trees, 27 species of snakes, and 400 species of butterflies. High in the trees are colobus monkeys with black fur fringed with white. Their long fur has a special purpose. As the monkeys make great leaps of up to 20 feet from tree to tree, the fur fans out. It forms a parachute so they do not fall too quickly. The mountainsides are covered in other types of vegetation, including evergreen forests and forests of bamboo. Higher up, the soil is too rocky for trees. The 
ground is covered in tufts of grass and giant lobelias, which look like a cross between a cactus and a pineapple. The flowers of the groundsel tree look like cabbages, but they are not so good to eat. Looking after nature. The canyons are proud of their rich wildlife. They have created more than 50 national parks and reserves to protect every type of ecosystem in the country. The most famous are Savo East, Savo West, Amboseli, and the Masai Mara in the savannas. Visitors can go to other parks to see life in the forests and highlands. From the capital, Nairobi, visitors often head to Mzima Springs in Savo National Park. The pools have underwater viewing tanks where visitors can watch hippos. The animals look slow and clumsy on land, but in the water they are graceful and quick swimmers. Lake Nakuru National Park is a bird watcher's paradise. Hundreds of thousands of flamingos feed on the algae that forms on the lake bed. When they take to the air, they fill the brilliant blue sky with a huge pink cloud. It is one of nature's great spectacles. There they are. Along the coast, marine parks protect the coral reefs, mangrove swamps, and seagrass meadows. Every year, the population of Kenya grows. More wild animals come into conflict with herders, farmers, or hunters. People kill elephants for their valuable ivory tusks, antelope for meat, and lions because they kill people and livestock. The Kenyan Wildlife Service, or KWS, asks local people to help them manage wildlife. The KWS builds fences, pays farmers whose crops are damaged, and explains how protecting wildlife can benefit communities by bringing money to the area. All Human History Here we go. Imagine trying to spot a piece of black bone the size of a matchbook in jumbled volcanic rock. You'd need super eyes. But that's just what Kamoya Kimeu did one day in 1984 in Kenya's Turkana Basin. He found a small piece of skull. Over the next five years, a team of scientists found and put together the rest of the skeleton. It belonged to an ape-like human or hominid who lived 1.5 million years ago. The bones were so old that they had turned to rocks, called fossils. The team had found one of our earliest ancestors. Fossil hunters have made many finds in Kenya. The fossils show that hominids changed over millions of years. Most scientists believe that they developed into modern humans. Northern Kenya and nearby Tanzania may have been the origin of everyone on the earth. Isn't it something? Missing links to modern humans. There's this clue right here. Look at that. The landscape of the Great Rift Valley, where Kamoya made his discovery, was much different a million years ago. Rivers flowed through grasslands full of animal life. There was plenty of food for the hominids. The rivers deposited soil washed down from the highlands. When hominids died near the rivers, the new soil covered their bodies. Over the years, the spaces made by the bones of the buried hominids filled with minerals. They formed stone fossils. When the landscape became drier, wind and water wore away the soil. The fossils reappeared on the surface, where you can still pick them up today. Hundreds of thousands of years after hominids lived in Kenya, early humans lived there. They had learned to make tools. They made axes from sharp pieces of hard rock and used them to cut up animals for food. Today, thousands of hand axes are scattered in the Rift Valley, but you need to be a real expert to find them on the stony ground. Scientists in Kenya are like detectives looking for clues. They want to fill in the gaps in the story of how hominids turned into humans. They know that early humans used stone tools for over a million years, even after they stopped hunting and began to keep animals in herds. By about 500 CE, ironworking skills had spread through much of East Africa. Ancient Traders 
Nearly 2,000 years ago, a Greek merchant wrote one of the world's first guidebooks. It was a little like the travel books people take on vacation today. It told traders how to get from place to place and what they could buy and sell. The book described how ships visited East Africa from India on the other side of the Indian Ocean. Indians were not the only visitors to East Africa. Many different peoples mixed with the Bantu speakers who lived near the coast. They created the modern-day Swahili people. Their name means of the coast in the Arabic language. Some Swahili merchants became very wealthy, especially during the 1400s. They built stone houses from blocks of dead coral taken from the ocean. They dressed in silk from India and ate off porcelain brought all the way from China. Coastal islands and ports like Manda and Pate became rich city-states. Each had its own ruling family, officials, and soldiers. The power of the city-states rose and fell. After centuries, Mombasa and Malindi became the richest ports. Their wealth attracted Portuguese and Turkish sailors. These pirates tried to control trade by attacking towns or forcing them to pay taxes. The Portuguese took over Mombasa. In 1698, Arabs from Oman helped the city of Pate drive out the Portuguese. In the 1800s, the Omani Arabs built a powerful empire along the East African coast. A cruel trade. Life was dangerous for some Africans under Arab rule. Arab traders captured East Africans and sold them as slaves. Africans also joined in the rich trade. People wanted slaves throughout the Arab empire. In the 1700s, European countries such as France, Britain, and Holland also needed slaves to work in their colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. In what is now Kenya, thousands of captives were taken to slave markets in Zanzibar and Uganda. Slavery was not banned until the 19th century. By then, descendants of Kenyan slaves lived around the world. Colonial Rule Europeans began settling East Africa in the 19th century. The British took control of an area that, in 1920, they named Kenya. Many native peoples fought the invaders. Others were tricked or bullied into making peace with the British, who did not keep their promises to treat the Africans well. The British government wanted white settlers to move to Kenya. From 1896 to 1901, the British built one of Africa's first railroads to carry settlers into western Kenya. So many settlers moved to the uplands that they became known as the White Highlands. The whites kept the best land for themselves. The Africans had to live on poor land in crowded reserves. The British made the Africans pay taxes for every home and for every adult. To get money to pay the taxes, Africans had to go to work for white farmers and businesses. Fighting for freedom. The Kenyans hated the occupation of their country. Harry Thuku and Jomo Kenyatta began a movement to get independence. Most of their supporters came from the Kikuyu people, Kenya's largest ethnic group. They got wider support after World War II. Many Kenyans fought with the British forces, but the British did not reward Kenya with independence. Some Kenyans saw violence as the only way to achieve independence. In the 1950s, they launched the Mau Mau movement. The Mau Mau attacked whites and Kenyans who did not support change. The movement was banned. Kenyatta was blamed for leading it and put in jail. In the 1960s, Britain faced unrest in many of its colonies, not just Kenya. It began to break up its empire. Kenyatta was released in 1961. Kenya's first elections were held in 1963. Kenyatta's party won, and he became the first president of independent Kenya. Many cultures and tongues. Imagine being in a cafe where everyone spoke a different language. It would be very exciting, but it might be confusing. It could happen in Kenya. Kenyans speak more than 60 languages and dialects. Almost everyone speaks more than one African language to make sure they can communicate widely. They also speak Swahili and English, which are used for business and for government. Kenya's 40 or so ethnic groups share some traditions of music, dance, art, and ways of life. 
Kikuyu are likely to be farmers, for example, while Maasai and Samburu are likely to be animal herders. As people move to the cities, however, they leave their traditional ways of life behind. Kenya city dwellers have created a vibrant culture drawn from many ethnic groups. A city outside a city. There's not enough good agricultural land to support Kenya's growing population, so people move to cities and towns to look for jobs. Many town dwellers are poor, but they manage to get by as best as they can. Just outside Nairobi lies Africa's poorest and biggest slum or shanty town, Kibera. Although it only measures about one square mile, Kibera is home to close to one million people. There are no facilities such as running water, sewers, or electricity. The people of Kibera are creative. They build houses from whatever they can find, even cardboard and packing crates. They run their own small businesses or set up self-help community groups. Children and Family In the country, communities are close. Everyone knows each other, so there are always children to play with or adults to help with chores. Families are large, and grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins usually live nearby. Each person has a job to do in the home and the community. Children in Kenya start elementary school at age six. If there is no school in the area, or not enough desks or books, people get together to build a school or to raise money. School is free, but many children are too busy to go to classes. They help their families working the land, tending cattle, cooking, or fetching water. Even children who do go to school help with many chores or do jobs to earn extra money. Young girls sometimes walk miles every day to get water. One of the most important times for Kenyan teenagers is coming of age, when they become adults. They often have a special ceremony called initiation. A group of boys or girls of the same age may spend days or weeks living away from home. They learn the skills they will need for their adult lives, how to behave well, and the history and legends of their community. At the end of their initiation, young Maasai men dance and sing for four days at the Unoto festival. In urban areas, however, initiation is getting less and less common. Just under 45% of Kenya's population is below 15 years of age. So although Kenya has seven universities, thousands of young Kenyans head to the United States, Europe, and Asia to study. Play and sport. Kenyan children love to play. If they don't have any toys, they often make their own from bent wire, beaded jewelry, or old boxes. They play games that do not need much equipment, like mancala. It only needs some seeds or stones, and a few holes in the ground. Children everywhere play soccer. If they don't have a ball, they kick around a bundle of racks. Although with so along with soccer, Kenyans enjoy cricket, golf, and boxing. But the sport for which Kenyans are most famous is running. They are experts at long-distance races, such as the marathon. They've set world records and won Olympic gold medals. Oh, that's a cool picture. Making music, song, and dance. Every ethnic group in Kenya has its own musical traditions. While styles are always changing, most music is based on drums and drumming, so it is great for dancing. Lively Swahili Tarab bands combine the sounds of Africa, Arabia, and India. That makes them very popular at weddings, where everyone wants to celebrate. Their songs sometimes poke fun at the bride and groom and their guests. Since the 1970s, Kenya has also had its own pop music. It uses reggae, rap, and Cuban rhythms to create a unique style known as benga. Telling stories. Something all Kenyans enjoy is listening to stories. The stories aren't always just for fun. Storytellers pass on the history of the community to young people and teach them about their own ethnic group. Kenyans have used stories and poems to pass on their beliefs, history, and customs for many centuries. Today, listeners might also learn about health or education from a storyteller or a street theater group. Many Kenyans enjoy reading. Kenya is proud of its high literacy rate. About 95% of people under 24 years of age can read. Swahili people 
began to write poetry more than 300 years ago. Since the early 1900s, Kenyans have been writing books in English, Swahili, and other African languages. Such writers, such as Ngugiwa Thiongo and Rebecca Njau, are read all over the world. Ngugi believed that African writers should write in their own languages rather than colonial languages, such as English. In 1980, he published the first modern novel in the Kikuyu language. Art to use or wear. Kenya has many artistic styles, but most of them share one thing in common. They are intended to be used or worn, not just looked at. They include the decorated wooden headrests used by northern herders and the carved wooden doors and chairs of the Swahili. Women often wear colorful jewelry, including bracelets, headdresses, large necklaces, and belts. Some pieces are made for special occasions, such as a wedding or an initiation ceremony. A woman's jewelry reflects her wealth and stage of life. Oh, look at this. Incredible. It's beautiful. Whether she is single or married, childless, or mother of sons. Some art forms are popular with tourists. The Kisi raise money selling their soapstone carvings of animals and people. The Mijikenda mark the graves of their ancestors with carved wooden poles, but many of the poles have been stolen to sell to collectors. Artists are adapting Kenyan traditions using modern materials and imagery. Many artists exhibit their work at Paya Pa, Swahili for the Antelope Rises. A Nairobi gallery founded by East Africa's best known artist, Limo Njau. A new nation. Look at that button. I know. <laughs> Although many older Kenyans cannot read, they still have a say in how the country is run. In 2005, all Kenyans got the chance to vote for or against a new constitution. It was an important vote because a constitution determines how people are governed and how they live with each other. The first constitution had been drawn up when Kenya became independent in 1963. Many people thought it was out of date. So that people who could not read would be able to vote, the symbol for a yes vote was a banana. To make a no vote, the symbol was an orange. In the vote, more Kenyans chose oranges than bananas and rejected the constitution. It was probably because they were unhappy with the government, which supported the new constitution. I wish they hadn't votes like that here. Kenyan politics since independence. After independence, Kenyans had great hopes for the future. Jomo Kenyatta was a popular prime minister and then president for the next 15 years. He brought political stability, economic progress, and educational advances to Kenya, but he also made sure that only his party could hold power. In 1974, he made all other political parties in Kenya illegal. The next president was Daniel Arap Moi. Kenya prospered, but Moi gave government jobs to people from his own ethnic group. If people criticized him, he put them in jail. Eventually, so many Kenyans were unhappy with Moi that he had to allow elections in which many political parties could take part. Moi won in 1992, but in 2002, Mwai Kibaki led an alliance of parties to power. Kibaki tried to get rid of corruption in the government. His government soon lost much of its popularity, however. The politicians gave themselves large pay raises, which made many Kenyans angry. People also thought that Kibaki's draft of a new constitution did not place strong enough limits on the power of the presidency. Which is why it got an orange vote. Living off the land. Although only 7% of Kenya is good farmland, 75% of Kenyans make their living from the land. Many farmers grow their own food, such as corn, millet, sorghum, cassava, and vegetables. Others grow cash crops to sell at markets. Growing fruit, flowers, and vegetables is one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. Kenyan vegetables and flowers are exported around the world. Some farmers work and sell together in cooperatives. They get better prices and can raise more money to invest in business. Large plantations are often owned by foreign companies. 
on the plains and savannas people keep herds of cattle and goats for milk meat and leather in the past these herders followed the rains they lived in temporary huts and moved from site to site with the seasons since the 1990s the government has encouraged herders to settle in one place that makes it much easier to know where they are and to make them pay taxes some of the herders still like to keep moving they worry that if there's not enough rain their herds will eat all the grass and trample the soil when it rains the soil washes away because there's no grass to hold it together about two-thirds of kenya's fish catch is exported the remainder provides food and work for people who live near lakes victoria and Turkana. on the coast big game fishing attracts tourists to watamu and Malindi they hope to catch huge ocean fish such as marlin or tuna trade and industry most kenyan factories are small they are based mainly in nairobi mombasa and kisumu some process food milling grain making beer or crushing sugar cane for example others make goods that kenyans need such as furniture batteries cloth and soap a few larger factories build cars they put the cars together from imported kits, like life-size models. The people who run many businesses are Asian Kenyans. Their ancestors came to Kenya to work as traders when the British built the first railroad, so trade is in their blood. Exports like cash crops are cheap compared to Kenya's imports. In 2005, Kenya's exports sold for about 3 billion US dollars, but its imports cost more than 5 billion dollars. The government tries to encourage exports and reduce imports so that more money stays inside Kenya. Self-help traditions. Kenya's national motto is Harambe, which means pull together. By pooling their time and money, people can build schools, clinics, and churches for the whole community. In towns and cities, people make their own job opportunities. They set up unofficial businesses all they need is a good idea. They might start a street stall or shine shoes or collect scrap metal to sell for recycling. There are so many of these informal businesses that they have their own special name, Jua Kali Enterprises. The name comes from the Swahili words Jua meaning sun and Kali meaning hot because many of the workers are outside in the tropical sun. The government is trying to get these traders to become official businesses so that they pay taxes. Challenges to prosperity. Kenya is a place of safety for its neighbors. Refugees often arrive to escape from wars or famine in neighboring Sudan, Ethiopia, and Somalia. It's tough to stop people crossing Kenya's borders. Sometimes it's hard even to know where the border is. Herders who live near the borders move back and forth across them without any need for a passport. AIDS is a huge challenge in Kenya, where more than 1.2 million people have the disease. Many children have been left without any parents, and life expectancies under 50 years. In 2003, the government launched a major offensive against AIDS. More testing, more education, and more treatment seem to have worked. Kenya soon became one of the few countries in Africa where the rate of new infection was falling. Tourism, Kenya's money spinner. Tourism is the second largest earner of foreign money after agriculture. Visitors have always come to see Kenya's wildlife and to relax on its beaches, but some are beginning to explore less visited areas. As local people share more in the profits of tourism, they see the benefits of conserving their environment. And that's the end of our book tonight. So thank you so much for watching. I do hope you found this video relaxing and educational. This is the end of Elephant Week, so say goodbye to Topple for now. I'll definitely be back. And have a very good, good, good night. Good night. Good night.